Hey, what is up, everybody? Welcome to the Guilty as Charged podcast. My name is Steven, and as, as always, I am the host. Joining me is my guy, Tyler, and uh, a special guest, returning special guest, friend of the show, Mr. Sean Side. Sean, we'll start with you, man. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing really well. I'm always excited about the start of the football season. I'm glad, you know, we're entering a new era of Chargers football, and it only feels right that we get to talk about it together. Yeah, we got some uh, kind of big-ish news, depending how much of a football sick you, you are today, that Scott Matlock has switched full-time to fullback, so that that's some fun news we can get into today, but uh, we'll see how today's discussion goes. Really excited about it. We are doing this on Tuesday. You guys are probably going to be listening to this on Wednesday. Uh, and then we have a five-day football weekend. we got games on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. It's going to be fantastic. Opening weekend with the NFL is always great. Uh, Tyler, you're here as well, man. How are you doing tonight? Doing well. The last time we had Sean on, I said, no way are the Chargers going to lose to the Dolphins. Like, what a prediction. Brandon Staley's defense is going to figure it out. They're going to hold <laughs> Tua and Mike McDaniel, and the Chargers are going to win that game. Not only was Sean right, uh, the season didn't go so well. So hopefully this season's better. Yeah. yeah. Uh, moral of the story there. Uh, <laughs> listen to Sean. He has great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but in all seriousness, all joking aside, really excited to have Sean on. We are going to dive into some of the nitty gritty things that we can expect to see from uh, this Greg Roman offense, as well as the Jesse Minter defense. It's a lot of changes for the Chargers. Um, and we've been kind of very curious to see how it go, how it's going to go. We've been diving into the preseason a bit here. So it should be a great conversation. Before we get started, obviously today's show and every show is brought to you guys by Prize Picks. It is the best and easiest way to consume daily fantasy sports. Tyler and I have had a great time doing it, and Prize Picks has been a great partnership for us. They do wonderful specials every single week. They just make it a bit easier as you kind of get into the swing of things if you're a new user. Um, in the month of September, they're going to have a special on Caleb Williams, as I've said previously. As long as Caleb Williams hits one single passing yard, you get that right as a positive in your specific uh, picks for the week. So it's a great way to sign up for Daily Fantasy. Gets you some extra skin in the game. Obviously, there's a ton of games going on this weekend. So strongly encourage you guys to get in on pricepicks.com slash guilty, code guilty at checkout for a deposit match up to $100. Again, that is pricepicks.com slash guilty, code guilty. All right, Sean, let's start with the offense. I think uh, when the Chargers obviously hired Jim Harbaugh, there was a lot of immediate dot connecting to Greg Roman. Obviously, they've worked together several times in the past. Greg worked for his brother in Baltimore. Um, it was a little bit of an underwhelming hire. So let, let's start with the positives here. And I think you probably have to start with the run game and, and how that's going to look. We've seen some glimpses, like I said, in the preseason, seven offensive linemen, a fullback, a tight end, very different. In today's football, though, like we've, we haven't really seen much of that in the NFL. It's, a, it's you know, m more passing, stuff like that. For you, how can this Greg Roman rushing offense kind of, take this Chargers offense to the next level. You know, Greg Roman does get a bad rap because of how things ended in Baltimore. And I hear you and I think I hear the fans and the initial hire was, oh man, you know, this may be not the most exciting name that is out there, but look, he is a very creative run game designer. He has seen very successful offenses. And I think he is going to help the Chargers establish a real, real identity where this year Kind of feels like a brand building exercise for the Chargers, where obviously, you know, I'm a huge fan of the Chargers social media, but on the field, there is a brand building that is happening there where it is something that the fan base can really kind of rally behind where I, I agree with you. And yes, the league is a passing league. Passing is what wins in this league. But because of that, so many defenses that the Chargers are going to see are going to play with lighter bodies. You're going to see two linebackers on the field constantly. And if you're a team that, you're putting a second tight end. You're putting a sixth offensive lineman out there. You're forcing some of those coverage players to constantly make tackle after tackle. I think that's a way that you can allow an offense to play on schedule. And look, we'll, we'll, we could talk about Justin Herbert until, until the lights go off on this one because you have a quarterback who can make every single throw. And that adds to the run game. Because if I'm a defense, I'm looking at it and saying, hey, I see all of your tight ends out there, but I am not be getting beat by Justin Herbert. And now you have to make a decision. Are you loading up that box? Uh, are you going to say, hey, let me just challenge these receivers where one throw from Herbert is just a touchdown? I think even if you were, you know, not super enthused with the hire, I think Steven and I were both like, yeah, okay, solid. 
you know, we all could agree that Greg Roman would elevate the floor of this offense with the run game, like you mentioned, of course, with Harbaugh on the offensive line play. We get it. The floor of the offense is going to be elevated compared to last year's outside of the very first week of the season. But I think we're all more concerned about the next step Greg Roman and this offense needs to take in the passing game. So what would you like to see him do or design that pushes the ceiling of this offense rather than just like elevating the floor? What what can he do? And maybe he didn't even do in Baltimore. And is that answer just, hey, I have Justin Herbert? I mean, it sounds like a great answer to me, right? You say it like it's some <laughs> some bad thing to say because I agree. Greg Roman is absolutely a floor raiser. I think you're getting competence on the offense, which is really, really positive, I think, to start. But Herbert is what pushes the ceiling, and it's going to be what allows Roman, I think, to access a different part of the passing game where now you can look at Herbert and say, hey, these are the passing concepts you've been comfortable with. This is how I teach it. Let's kind of go along with that because he can hit every single inch of grass on a football field with the football. So from a design perspective, you know, I mean, Roman had Lamar Jackson uh, for a long time. And though Herbert is a great, great athlete, we shouldn't expect him to be using Herbert as like a power runner. But I really want to see how strong that play action game is. When you get that extra lineman, when you get that extra tight end on the field, how much do you or how yeah are your runs really looking like those play action passes? Are you really able to force that safety down into the box with a hard run fake and be able to create explosives that way? And then there's also just, the little things like the, the little seasoning on top, whether it's those shifts before the snap, whether it's those motions where you're going to see a big new fullback running across the, the formation and get a head start as they're snapping the ball, because you can, I think, live with this offense if it's so run heavy, if you're still able to dial up enough shots where you have a quarterback that's going to be able to make it happen. Hmm. Yeah, I think one of the things that we're so curious and excited about is is the work that this regime can do with the offensive line, obviously selecting Joe Alt, you know, instead of a receiver shows very evidently like the kind of identity this wants to, that this, this regime wants to establish. But in terms of utilizing these two offensive tackles, I think, uh, you know, that's that's like the bread and butter of the offensive line right now. You have an all pro player, you have Joe Alt, who's a freakish athlete. How, how does Greg you like utilize the tackles from what you've seen in Baltimore. You know, I know that there was a statistic about, you know, the Ravens pulling their tackles quite often, but to get the most out of Roshan and Joe specifically, how would you see uh, Greg kind of pulling that out of them? That's uh, such a great point because tackles that are able to slam down that line of scrimmage are really able to make such a difference in the run game where you can now use the defense's leverage against them and create holes that way. I would certainly expect Joe Alt to be pulling a lot. It is so fun to watch some of this guy's snaps. He's like 6'8". He can bend <laughs> so, so well. It's it's freakish. It really is freakish. So when, you know, when Harbaugh said, oh, we're, you know, we're going to use Joe Alt as a weapon, I was like, oh, okay, like, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll see about that. But I think it's true. Like, the Lions use Penny Sewell as a weapon. He's not on mm. their skill position chart, but it feels like he is because of the way he pulls because of the designs that you can have around that, when you have a tackle that can really move, whether it's, you know, you're faking a run to the right, now it's an outside run to the left, that right tackle is pulling all the way across the formation. All it is a really, really athletic tackle. So I do want to just see him using his power, but also using that that agility in different ways. So I would expect, like, Greg Roman's looking at this like, oh, Joe, like, get those hips opened up, let's get some stretching, because you are going to be pulling over and over where you can now change the whole entire strength of the formation after the snap when you're moving people over kind of to that weak side, particularly when defenses see, is that three tight ends on the field? Is that four tight ends? Is Harbaugh lining up on the field? And now the defense is going to overload to one side. You have the speed and ability to get back to the other side on the run. Yeah, I, I am so excited to watch this offensive line play. I don't know about against Max Crosby in week one. That doesn't sound super fun. But overall, like I'm going to enjoy watching three former first round picks including Joe Alt, like you mentioned, along the offensive line. It's a very talented group. What's not as much, of course, is the, I mean, I guess you could debate either way, but the wide receiver room and even the tight end room, it's not the greatest group of pass catchers. There's no all-pro tight end here. As of right now, there's no Pro Bowl, all-pro kind of type wide receiver. You could call it an average group. How much of that is a concern? Because not only is it not a great receiver group, but then, there's no Mark Andrews here, for example. Like, how do you think Greg Roman works with that? And how much of a concern is that for you in terms of projecting how well this offense could do? 
Yeah, I think calling it average might be a little bit kind because there are a lot of reasons to be concerned about the wide receiver room. I think the Chargers fans understand that. I know you guys understand that. The Chargers, they're going to try and mitigate that where they'll probably have like the lowest percentage of 11 personnel in the entire league this year. And their run rates are going to be really, really high. And I think that they're banking on high, high end quarterback play that helps raise your receiver room up a little bit. And then, hey, you can look ahead to that 2025 draft class. I know that Steven's watching Utah and all the other teams that are out there. So <laughs> there are a bunch of guys that, that I think you can get excited about in the future. From the tight end room, you know, you, to me, you just need to have a role. If you're a blocking tight end, you can live that way. You know, you can you can earn your NFL paychecks that way and you can help the offense move forward. But certainly, 100%, the largest concern, the biggest hiccup, because Herbert, again, he can make every single throw. But you might not have, you know, what like what your target share looks like, maybe not the most inspiring. Yeah. To your point about 11 personnel, I think they were like 25th in the preseason in 11 personnel usage. So it's it's not going to be a, a, a huge thing. But, you know, I think we'll expect to see plenty of targets for Joshua Palmer and Ladd McConkey. Uh, final question about the offense. I think Greg Roman and, and company are obviously very familiar with Gus Edwards and J.K. Dobbins. But. I think if you like isolate their specific situations, it's very mysterious, I guess. Gus Edwards last year had a career high usage, but his efficiency numbers were not great. You look at J.K. Dobbins, he's had several injuries, you know, unfortunately for him. He says he's fully healthy. He was like voted as a an alternate team captain. So the, the team is like very high on J.K. Dobbins, I think. But there's still the issue of of the explosiveness. So for those two obviously we know they work together they've worked together in the past but now in 2024 what what's your expectation for their individual roles i'm glad that you mentioned you know roman has of course worked with both of them in baltimore so it feels like a coach that understands those players and putting players in the best position to succeed is really the job so when you see those two tight ends i think that there's going to be a lot of times where just using motion is going to really help these guys similar to how it was in baltimore and you know, I wouldn't be surprised by year end if it's a high usage, low efficiency year, but you can still be impactful when you're that kind of player. Now, who's the thunder? Who's the lightning? I guess, you know, that will be to be seen. I think Dobbins does have more breakout potential, particularly on some of those longer runs. But these guys are going to be running downhill, attacking at you gap schemes like, you know, Roman calls a power king where there's two tight ends. Now we're running power to that close side and the defense just kind of can't do anything about it because there's so many big bodies there. So you know, efficiency, I think that, that that may not be the word that I use to, to, to lead with this. But again, in a league that mm -hmm. wants to play smaller on defense, if you're going to play bigger on offense, even though, I mean, I know we all believe in it, that passing is going to be more efficient than running all the time. There's still maybe a little bit of an edge to be had. And then you get into the into the red zone. And now we can maybe see Justin Herbert get involved in the run game a little bit. Switching over to the defense now and, and talking about guys that have to stop the run and maybe the way things are changing in the NFL Navarro Bowman, the Chargers linebacker coach, and this linebacker room, it's I'm buying the hype in this linebacker room just off the preseason. And I get that's very dangerous, but I see the improvement in the room and I believe in the way they want to play defense and in Jesse Minter. The Chargers really haven't solidified that room in a while and certainly not under Brandon Staley. There's always maybe a guy, but they'd leave. Kenneth Murray didn't work out, but it really feels like not only are they solidifying that room, but they're investing in that room too. And of course, the Baltimore Ravens definitely invested in linebacker. What does consistent, like elevated linebacker play do for our defense? Because for me as a Chargers fan, I haven't seen that in a while. So what does that do for Jesse Minter's defense? I'm so glad that Bowman is there because he was just a player I loved watching. And I'm sure he's really going to be able to help those guys. And linebacker play for this specific defense where, you know, every year there's, oh, well, what is the hot new defensive trend? And Chargers fans I know have been burned a little bit by that kind of that trend where it was Brandon Staley previously. But this is like what what is cool in the NFL. It's cool in the NFL because it pairs down a lot of the kind of complications of a defense. It makes it very, very easy for players to learn. So I think that linebackers in this defense are going to have not necessarily an easier job, but they're going to know their roles. It's, you're, we're going to see less examples of, of you know guys looking in four different directions. You have to match routes in a specific way. I think the way that they match routes is a positive thing for linebackers. Now, in Baltimore, we had Roquan Smith. When you have, if you just have two linebackers on the field, one that can just take up more physical space in terms of what they can cover 
it allows your other linebacker to just play downhill. You know, Patrick Queen was involved in stunts in the past game kind of all the time. And Roquan Smith there is an eraser because in the modern NFL, the offensive coordinator's job is pretty much, hey, let me pick out the linebacker that I'm going to be able to throw at all game and just do that. So I do think, you know, am I buying the hype? Maybe a little bit less than you, Tyler, but I, I could see a high upside case where those players, that coaching group in this specific defense is able to kind of work all together to get to a level of, of even just competence that maybe Chargers fans have been waiting for for so long. Yeah, I think uh, the linebacker room, I, Tyler and I have kind of discussed this on our, on our show. It's it's kind of the biggest like revival tour, I guess, of, of any position group on the team right now. It's been such a weakness in the past. There was that one really good year of Drew Tranquil and Kaiser White, and then it was just been kind of a, a tough position to watch. But I, I'm curious about Denzel Perriman's role here because he, to me, is kind of – you know, your potential like Patrick Queen type, and he'll just come in and, you know, hit a pulling guard in the face while Dan Henley and Junior Colson, whoever is playing after him, it can just kind of roam and, and tackle. So I think Denzel Perryman, while from like a national sense, isn't getting a ton of pub, I do think he fits perfectly with what Jesse Minter wants to do. And then it just can kind of make things easier for the two young linebackers behind him. I think that's a really important thing because now defensive coordinators think are doing a just a little bit better job where every linebacker doesn't have to do every single thing because every player is not Navarro Bowman. Like, you don't even have that. Obviously, Bowman had Willis next to him. But if you have one linebacker that is able to really cover in different ways and a coordinator that is smart enough and creative enough to, look, a linebacker that can hit a guard in the face is going to help your defense. And if that player has to play downhill more often, that's fine. And you can live in that world. Now, that may mean sometimes that, hey, we're going to drop out a defensive end or or kind of get funky there where the Chargers have a lot of defensive ends that you want those guys going forward instead of playing back. But I, I think I, I just trust Minter where he's off, obviously off that McDonald tree, but he's been able to run it by himself. You know, he has been able to see the problems that the system has. He's been able to troubleshoot it and find solutions, which for me is really the biggest thing as a coordinator on both sides of the ball. And he like, look, there was a play in the preseason where I'm watching it and it's like a, a little, you know, quarterback looks right. Uh, flips over left real quick. The cornerback is super quick to that route, playing more aggressive. And you're going to see some of the same exact coverages that we saw from the Chargers last year under Brandon Staley. But you can have the same exact defensive play call with the same exact players. And it can look so different just based on how aggressive a player is or kind of how that physicality is expressed. So I think overall now I feel like talking about it, I'm even more excited about the Chargers defense than I was kind of starting out. Yeah, you know, I think this is great timing to have you on because Daniel Popper of The Athletic did a great piece on on Derwin James today. And, and Derwin spoke about how him and Jesse Minter, like they had to sit down early and acknowledge that 2023 was not Derwin James's best season. I think we saw glimpses of the previous player, especially at the end of the season. But he spoke about, you know, last year he had so many different roles. He, his mind was just going 100 miles per minute and he was thinking way too much every single week. And one snap he's playing on the edge, one snap he's playing linebacker, next snap he's playing deep safety. For you, when you look at where Derwin was at last year and what we've seen in this McDonald system, you know, obviously Kyle Hamilton comes to mind, some of these other safeties. How realistic is a revival tour for Derwin James? I think it's realistic because, look, Derwin James is... I have to ask, he's just my type of player. I'm not going to quit him. You can't make me quit him because he has the skills to match up with players in the slot. He always wants to hit. And he, I do think when he's healthy, he still has that athleticism. So I'm glad that, you know, Derwin James was open that, yeah, last year was not his best year. And the, the role point is so, so important because one of the drawbacks of, you know, all these defenses are complicated. I don't ever want to pretend like any of these, these defenses are simple. But yeah, when you have to play so many different roles, it can make it really hard. So when you give a player a specific role and say, hey, on third downs, you are an edge rusher. For example, obviously Derwin James is not going to do that. You know, that player can buy into that role. They're, they're really practicing that same technique over and over. Now when they're watching film, they're just saying, hey, all I need to see is what the left tackle is setting at. Like that is my plan of attack. So I do think though that because James has flexibility, I would be surprised if he's just playing, you know, one safety the entire season. But if he is playing one safety the entire season, this defense has the ability, you know, you can move that safety down. You can move them across. You can have them kind of like jump out in different ways. So even being in one role, you can still have that flexibility expressed in different ways. Yeah, I'm always glad having you on to to talk about 
anything Chargers because you're you have an objective lens. Again, last year we just mentioned like you came and said, <laughs> "No, the Chargers are losing," um, and you were right. So I appreciate having you on because we can hype up the 2021 seventh round pick corner and be like, "Yeah, he's gonna have a breakout year," <laughs> uh, but you have a much more objective approach. And look, I think I'm buying into the defense. I've, I've I've really liked it more and more watching it during the preseason. But at the end of the day, and Chargers fans push back on me on this one, but they don't have an elite interior defensive line. They don't have an elite corner room. And when you're looking at, and I know people aren't huge fans of PFF grades, but if you're looking at teams that have a great edge room, but a subpar below average defensive tackle room and DB room, no, no shade of Joe and James, but mostly the corners there, the best that these teams have done with those big gaps between the edge room and then D tackle and, and corner is like 22nd in EPA per play. And that was the defense that the Cowboys had that got their defensive coordinator fired. The Chargers have been on that list, the, the 10 biggest gaps, three separate times already over the last like 15 seasons, um, two under Brandon Staley. Basically, what I'm asking is the Chargers were 27th in EPA per play last year, I believe. Like, How far can they actually jump this year, understanding that they have a great edge group and I think a good safety group, but everywhere else is either a concern or not so great? I, you know, I, again, you know, you guys know I'm an optimistic person. I, I like to be <laughs> positive. I, it does feel like, you know, 20 is kind of the ceiling in a few different ways where really uh, it's easy for me to say because, you know, I don't have like, you know, Chargers posters hung up on my walls, but <laughs> it feels like an eat your vegetables kind of year. You got it right. Like mm. they're clearly structuring this with a long term vision where going forward, they don't have like a ton invested in a lot of different players. So they're going to be able to, you know, they can work through this system with Minter on offense. They can work through our Minter on defense and with Roman on offense. You can find, hey, this is a player that really is good in this specific role in Jesse Minter's defense. And how will it actually translate to the long term? Because look, there are just absolutely holes in this defense. And a lot of the reasons why the Ravens were able to do a lot of fun things where you get just like an insane Jadavian Clowney season out of nowhere. Everyone is doubting Patrick Queen. And now uh, Mike McDonald is able to find a role for him. So those holes, particularly, you know, in that, that secondary, those are, I think, really, really concerning to me, where even if you have a great edge rush, now a great edge rush is going to make your coverage unit's life a little bit easier, and Minter is going to be in a lot of zone coverage where he's going to maybe not necessarily intentionally avoid man coverage, but look, I mean, you, you guys see the roster, you know it. You know, when you, even in week one against the Raiders, where the Raiders have a bunch of good pass catchers, you're not going to want to play one-on-one -on -one with Devontae Adams every single snap. So there's a chance that they're able to reach a higher ceiling when it's kind of a combination of everything where an edge room is really attacking. Maybe you're, you're using stunts in the pass game to generate even more pressure, a little bit of linebacker rush in there. And now we have players that are dropping the zones and kind of matching in that way, as opposed to, you know, the daily mentality of pretty much like everything is kind of man coverage unless something specific happens. And, you know, you could, you could maybe raise the ceiling there just a touch. Love that. Love that. Uh, one like quirky little scheme thing we've seen from Jesse Minter, which I'm very curious carries over to the season or not, uh, is this emphasis on the slot blitz. Like we did a, a show before training camp and we titled it, is Jesse Minter going to blitz like a psychopath? During the preseason, the answer was yes. And specifically the slot players. It's I think in the first preseason game, there were like 14 or 15 slot blitzes that Jesse Minter called. Um, do you think that blitz heavy nature is going to carry over into the season with these great edge rushers? And then secondary, like to that question, what does, what about the slot blitz is in vogue right now? Cause uh, Daniel Jeremiah pointed out that there's a ton of this going around in the preseason. So two part question there for you. Is he really going to blitz like a psychopath and two specifically the slot blitzes? like what's, what's working about that specific call for the NFL play callers right now? I will say the the one of the big differences between Minter and McDonald is that I do think that yeah, Minter really wants to send that pressure and that nickel pressure particularly is something that we saw a ton with his defense at Michigan. And actually, it, to me, it's more nuanced than just like like blitzing because he is attacking the offense, which I guess is kind of a lame way to say blitzing or a different way to say blitzing. But it's an answer in the pass game where it is. It's it can be kind of safe where if you feel comfortable with your safety rolling down, you know, your safety is is in a decent spot to be able to play man coverage or not man coverage, but like a zone kind of match coverage. And then on the opposite side, maybe you're dropping your defensive end, but in the run game, it adds that nickel body where a lot of times, you know, that player is not exactly accounted for right away. And even in pass protection, 
they're sometimes just, you know, like the pass protection is working out to the nickel, but the nickel can a lot of times be an extra player there. So overall, I certainly see Minter as someone that, that wants to heat it up in different ways, but you can be kind of quote safe where you're only blitzing for you, get into that simulated pressure world and drop a defensive end away. And it just, it just feels like a, I agree that like across the league, certainly in preseason where these guys are running kind of their day one, day two install training camp stuff where that nickel off the edge play cover three behind it is just is so like rooted in, in, in the, the whole entire NFL. So it feels like you have to carry that. But in a league where you're playing that nickel defense so often four down linemen, two linebackers getting that third kind of they're not a linebacker, but their nickel can play like a linebacker if they're blitzing is a really, really helpful thing. When you're playing against teams with that, you know, they put another tight end, they put a second tight end on, out on the field and maybe run into some of your lighter looks. I'm not going to ask the question that I don't even expect you to have an answer for. If you do, you're kind of a sicko, but it's totally fine. How much Shane Bowen, Mike Rabel, and the Titans have you watched the last three years or so? I mean, of course, a ton because, you know, Bowen <laughs> has had a lot of fun. Uh, against the Chiefs, and I really like what he's mm. done a few different times where it's they're going to play man coverage, they're going to play cover one in different ways, and then they're going to find a way to rotate a safety uh, to Travis Kelsey in different yeah. ways. So, you know, he's, he's going to New York, but it'll be interesting to see. Yeah. He's, like, had, like, a little bit of interesting kind of dabbling in some of, like, interesting safety rotations. Yeah. But, I mean, the cool stuff is Mike McDonald, Tyler. What, what, what are we doing talking about Shane Bowen? Because, okay, so weird, right? In 2021, Jesse Minter coached 10 minutes down from where at Vanderbilt, coached a defensive coordinator, a secondary coach, 10 minutes from where the Titans played. The Chargers, for whatever reason, now have six former Titans players from that era on their roster. Four of them are going to contribute significantly on defense. I was just curious, like, it's um, it's Bud Dupree, Ed Rusher, T.I. Tart, the nose tackle, Elijah Molden, the DB, and then Christian Fulton, the corner. These guys are going to play a ton. I'm yeah. just curious... Like, what is it about that Titans defense that might have been so alluring? Because one, maybe two is a coincidence. Four is a pattern. So I'm just curious what they maybe saw in that 2021 defense. What did Minter see in those guys or that style of guy um, that was seemed so alluring? Because now four of them are playing for the Chargers this year. I do think that having familiarity is so important. And I think everyone knows that with the Chargers, whether it's, you know, the Harbaugh brothers hiring guys from each other. And that, that, that can end up being really positive. You talk about Molden specifically, I think that he has versatility as a defensive back. You know, you play in the bo in the box a bunch for the Titans. He played in the slot. He's lined up at regular safety. So that's a situation where maybe you get into kind of a bigger nickel look where you have three safeties on the field. Maybe that allows you to let Derwin James really, really be siloed kind of in one thing. So I, I will say that, you know, I think maybe last year Shane Bowen falls out of favor a little bit. I think two years ago, I think the hipsters are in on Bowen overall. So, you know, that... <laughs> that style, that mentality of it's attacking, mm. it's modern. You know, you, you can let your defensive linemen really, really attack while still kind of having some fun on the back end is something that that I liked back then. You know, like mm. I keep mentioning those Chiefs games because those are what really, really stuck out because those are the biggest games. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm fine with, with going back to some people you're familiar with. There you go. There you go. Love to see that. Um, Sean, this has been great, man. We really appreciate all of your insight as always. We'll get you out of here on this. Um, the Chargers win total right now is at eight and a half on the season. The national perspective of the Chargers is kind of up and down. Some people think they're going to be bad. I think Mina Kimes had them at like six wins. No shade. You know, it is what it is. Uh, some people think they're going to make the playoffs, even if Easton Stick is the quarterback still. So there's just a lot of Harbaugh field people out there as well. So both ends of the spectrum. And you said you're an optimist. So make the case for the over for the Chargers hitting at eight and a half. I think that the the case for the over is Justin Herbert is a hyper, hyper efficient quarterback where we know that if you just like had him throw 50 times a game, you're super, super cool with that because he's so good. But now we have him where, look, he maybe only throw the ball 30, 35 times in a game. And that's OK, because those looks are going to be premium, premium looks because the defense, I think, looks at this roster and says, you're not going to be able to beat me on the outside. We can play man-to-man -man coverage with the receiver, but there is no coverage for a perfect pass. So I think that, you know, Roman helps raise that floor. It's not a division. That's the strongest, of course, outside the Chiefs, which everyone everyone is familiar with. You can win four games in division, I think, really, really, or maybe not easily, but you can really make that happen. Joe Wall, I feel like, is comfortable making that switch over to right tackle where he hasn't played left tackle since he was five years old. So I think his body's going to be able... Mm -hmm 
to be good. And that run game is just able to, I mean, you know, I don't want to say establish the run, but establish enough competence to be able to keep defenses kind of on their heels in different ways. And then on the defensive side, the defense is, is it feels simple when we're watching it on film, but really I think it's, it's specific and complex in different ways. But again, they just need minimum competency here. So you, even if I, like I said, I think it's an eat your vegetables year in a lot of ways, maybe a lot of vegetables, maybe the Chargers fans have eaten too many vegetables over the years. I could see a case for them going over, even if you know that that may not fully be my belief. Well, and eat your vegetables kind of year. That's a fun one. I can't wait to sell that one to the Chargers fans, but it is true. And I'd appreciate your perspective. So we're thinking like nine wins. Like I, I, th- I think eight is a good number there. You know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not ready to be talked into nine. I'm certainly not ready to be talked into double digits. But it feels like before, or like maybe kind of around the draft, and then after the draft, I think people were were in an understandable zone where that kind of six, seven, eight number is right. And I, I can't blame people for being excited about it. I cannot blame anyone. For being hardball pilled i understand it i get it <laughs> i've been there before i may be there again but it, it feels like that you know vegas sets the numbers for a reason i i kind of like eight there uh and again i think a lot of this year is seeing things for next year which guys i know that's not helping anyone out i know that i don't want to tell anyone hey guys just uh you know tune in next year when i'm back on <laughs> telling you about all the things that these players grew into yeah i think that's that's fair and listen like the the team is gonna have like 80 million dollars in cap space next year they're, they think they're gonna have 10 draft picks like that's really where we're going to see how much joe ortiz and jim harbaugh can like really like start to build this thing so should be a ton of fun i think the chargers are gonna be frisky i think they're gonna be physical very different kind of frisky than we're used to it used to just be like oh they have a great quarterback they'll be good now it's like okay they want to come punch you in the mouth and i can't wait to see that identity change come to fruition uh, Sean, where can people find you? What do you and, and your friend Tej have coming up? Uh, plug away, my man, as, as you do great work and we love having you on. So uh, where can people find your work right now? Appreciate that so much. I'm at Side Schemes on Twitter, the Stats and, Steam po- Stats and Scheme podcast, wherever you find podcasts. And I'm also on the Ringer's Philly special podcast doing Eagles film reviews uh, every week. You know, feel free to visit sumersports.com. Just press refresh a few times. So the higher ups there keep letting me do the fun stuff. And then once I get Harbaugh pilled, I, I will write the Harbaugh pill article once it happens. I, you know, I just want everyone to know, look, it, it's <laughs> things change so fast in the NFL. There's not a long time where teams are like really in the kind of same tier over and over again. So like I said, you know, feel free to give me that follow on Twitter. And then once the charges are really good, send me as many DMS as you want to. Uh, I can't wait to see the change in like the, the chargers film Twitter clips, you know, go from like Justin Herbert does this amazing thing or like Derwin James does this blitz to like, here's an eight man offensive lineman run that Jim Harbaugh and Greg Roman are calling. I can't wait. It's going to be a fantastic storyline. Uh, Sean, thanks so much for joining us, man. We really appreciate it. Chargers fans, make sure like subscribe, comment to the guilty as charge podcast, as well as stats and schemes. Uh, Sean and Tej do great work over there and we appreciate them so much for joining us. Sean, uh, this has been a pleasure as always. Chargers fans, we'll see you next time. Bolt up.